I'm pleased to welcome you to the Paul C. Wilt Phi Kappa Phi le Faculty Lecture Series. And we are blessed tonight to have that take place in the presence of Dr. Paul C. Wilt. <laughs> Dr. Wilt worked tirelessly to establish Phi Kappa Phi at Westmont and was a guiding presence through uh, a, a number of years. Um, the format of the evening is that we will have an address and then we will have two faculty respondents respond to the address. Uh, the speaker will have the opportunity to respond to the responses and then we will throw the floor open for questions for a question and answer session. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Cynthia Toms. Uh, Dr. Toms has her PhD with a dissertation on global development through inter international volunteerism and service learning. We don't often have a Phi Kappa Phi address delivered by someone who's speaking directly to the topic of their dissertation, but uh, Dr. Toms is able to do so. Westmont has a number of study abroad programs and service uh, programs. Dr. Toms has been the head of global education for Westmont for the last three years and has been involved in the creation of a number of new study abroad programs. She will be transitioning to the kinesiology department, but we are pleased to have her speak tonight uh, on international volunteerism. Dr. Toms. Okay, so first I just wanna, I wanna make sure that I thank everyone for being here. I know that we have busy times in the semester and I appreciate um, the many of you in this room that I hope to enter into this conversation. I wanna hear from you. I welcome your insights. I wanna especially thank Paul Wilt for being here. Uh, I wanna thank Paul Delaney for helping to organize the Phi Kappa Phi lecture along with the Gady Institute and the Provost Office for sponsoring. You know, it's not very often that um, we academics that sit in our little spaces and think about these things for long periods of time and read lots of things about them, have a chance to kind of share them with our family, if you will. We go out and we talk at conferences and we give these papers, but it feels to me like a rare opportunity to have this conversation here with all of you. So um, on Friday, Mark reflected in one of our faculty meetings about sometimes when you have a task, you find surprising amounts of life as you walk through that mundane task. And I admit this weekend when I thought, oh, I have to finish the lecture, um, I was thinking it was gonna be a mundane task and I had the best weekend. And I'm so excited to kind of just be here and to be in this space. Because I do think this is a really important topic and I do think that um, it bodes our thinking caps and our willingness to engage it in a room that invites those kinds of lofty questions, but also deep thinking. So without further ado, ethical international volunteerism and service, moral responsibility or more harm than good. Recent critiques of international volunteerism and short-term missions have found their way beyond academic literature into popular media and even the blogosphere. In 2011, long-term volunteer Jamie Wright, otherwise known as Jamie the Worst Missionary, started a heated online debate with a post entitled, Are We Calling This a Win-Win? An excerpt from the post reads like this. I want to fill a van marked tourists with unbelievably rich people, and then I want to bring them to your middle class neighborhood. To take pictures of you and your kids and your house and your cars, I'll tell them bluntly, most of these people will never ride in a helicopter. They'll never meet the president or own a show horse. And they'll glance at each other with looks of angst and sadness and they'll shake their heads at the injustice of it all. And then I'll let the details of your simple life sink in as they snap pictures of your no-thrills mid-size SUV and your quarter-size lot. And I'll stand aside so they can get pictures of each other smiling with their arms around your kids in hand-me-downs. Oh, and maybe they can take turns helping you cut your hedge and clean your bathroom. And then you can show some of them how to make a sandwich. That would be so great for the video they're putting together. They're gonna take back to the super elite rich people church, but don't worry. There will be totally, there will totally be something in it for you. The rich people are going to paint all of the houses on your block, for real. They're going to pay for it and all the work and everything and also, they're going to do a puppet show for your kids and give them candy and other crap to eat. So it's a win-win. 
even if you're extremely uncomfortable while all this is going on, in the end, you'll look at your, friendly, at your freshly painted house and it will make you feel good about what just happened. And when the rich people go home, they'll get to tell their people about how they painted your house and learned how to make a sandwich, which of course will make them feel good too. So like I said, it's a win-win. Well, it's no secret that unintended consequences can come from well-meaning endeavors. The rhetoric surrounding international volunteerism has reached new heights in recent years. The critiques of international volunteering and the many forms that it takes has come under unscrup un unscrupulous and even vitriolic fire, as you just heard. From, from blogs and writings like the one I just read to you, they take clear aim at some forms of international volunteering as an act of misguided do-gooderness, and recent headlines have moved beyond just simple concerns about unintended consequences to demonstrate the type of satire and slapstick critique often reserved for late night commentators, such as when Stephen Colbert created a montage on glamour slumming, which he dubbed <coughs> glumming. But the sentiment, if, if you look on this slide, there's actually um, a luxury hotel there in the corner, and this is a place that you can stay if you get to South Africa and want to have an opportunity to understand luxury glumming. But the sentiment has spanned the gamut. Thinly veiled satire at the Huffington Post 2014 article, The Problem with Little White Girls and Boys and Volunteerism. Overt pleas for rational reconsideration, such as the New York Times, is volunteerism just plain wrong? To entire websites dedicated to reversing the trend of volunteering. Some are thoughtful and witty, some not so much. One of the most popular visited, some of you in this room may know about it, it is called End Humanitarian Douchery which probably needs no further explanation. But since we're all here tonight, I thought I'd say a few words about their seven principles that they call the seven sins of humanitarian douchery, and they are research slothery, which they call your sloth-like laziness that doesn't allow you to take time to research volunteer organizations and host communities, work in pride, volunteering as gluttonous consumption, the greedy grabby volunteering, fishing for envy, and raging in lightning wrath, which is when volunteers return home and look down on others for having, done, for having not done the same thing. We've all probably run into that. And then my personal favorite, lusting for likes. So one must begin to wonder, how did we get here? How did all of this perception of what was once an all good in Denver turn so bad? And what's at the heart of these vitriolic concerns? Is there evidence that supports these claims? and perhaps even more relevant for those of us in the room involved with service or missions, or even sending or preparing those who are going to do it, these questions raise things for us like, is international volunteerism part of what we should be doing? Or is it really more harm than good? How are we to respond to these differing messages? This topic is not only deeply interesting, hopefully to you, I know it is to me, but it's also deeply personal. With the evolution of short-term missions adopting ways that attempt to erect justice over models that focus um, on erecting justice more than what used to be charitable service, more and more short-term missions are focused on development objectives rather than traditional evangelical practices. Vacation Bible schools and puppet shows have given way to dental and medical outreach, water projects, and building schools. This is relevant today. Perhaps we have been a part of missions teams and worked really hard to raise money, to plan a visit, to take off of work and either gather resources, money, clothes, building supplies. And then we toiled day and night, only to look back years later, or heck, maybe even in the middle of the project, and begin to wonder what the real impact of all of our efforts and time really was. Or we see possible harm or overreach in our attempt to care for the communities that we really wanted to serve. At a minimum, most of us have had that moment when someone returned home from a short-term missions trip and they relayed that famous line, I went to serve, but I gained more than I gave. Which for many of us seems deeply counterintuitive to an endeavor that's really aimed at balancing the scales rather than tilting them further in our already overabundant direction. So this is where we're headed tonight. I wanna have a conversation but I don't want to lose the importance of the questions in the thick of academic jargon. I want to lay a foundation that allows us to take off the scales and take an honest look at this issue, at ourselves, at our world, based on what we know or are willing to question about international volunteering and service. In order to do this, I'll first provide a bit of background on international volunteerism, its evolution and its scale, 
as well as some helpful delineations and commonalities between missions, volunteerism, service learning. Next, I'll introduce some theoretical tools to critically examine how international volunteerism both empowers and constrains communities, and why modern critiques make a clarion call away from reinforcing dominant paradigms, namely that the poor of developing countries require the help of affluent Westerners to induce development, which ultimately reinforces a hegemonic discourse of need and echoes toward a neoliberal ideology and normalizes the combination of volunteering and tourism within a framework of market capitalism, which some have called the concurrent commercialization of development and difference. And finally, I'll conclude with some proposed strategies for not only avoiding harm, but for inviting the greatest potential for, for common good for ourselves and our communities when we undertake service and missions. I realize it's a lofty amount of information. Many of you know me, I plan to talk East Coast fast. Um, but I'm deeply passionate about this issue. It was a topic, as um, Paul mentioned, of my dissertation. And uh, also several articles and now a working book manuscript. And consequently, some of my research from examining three rural communities in Costa Rica over the course of seven months in 2013 and 2014 will undergird some of this discussion. Also, some of the learning that I garner tonight will hopefully refine some of that work. In that vein, I do want to say a deep and sincere thank you to my two respondents tonight, to Dr. Tom Connect and Dr. Chris Heckley, who not only took the time to be here tonight and to respond, but who they themselves think well about these issues, teach well about these issues, and are working to really incorporate students' outreach, service, in their dis different endeavors. So we've had conversations offline. I'm excited to do it in a more public space. So thank you to both of you. OK, and so as we begin, I want to take a brief moment and set a foundation for what it is we're talking about. Beliefs concerning the origin of international volunteerism are generally divided into two camps, both of which have led to a significant influence in our modern understanding of the practice. The first belief holds that tradition hails from people, suffer from people offering their services through conscript by assisting the war wounded. The second view attributes uh, international volunteerism to the accompaniment of colonial period within the tradition of Christian missionary service. So, so the first. Literature report, uh, supporting the first belief attributes growth of volunteerism to post-1945 reconstruction in Europe, an era which also saw the beginning of the end for formal colonialism and marked the formation of the United Nations. This newly formed collaboration not only significantly changed world affairs and alliances, but it also signaled the value of equality among nations and a global responsibility to alleviate poverty. Emblematic of this interdependent, this interdependence, President Harry Truman's 1945 inaugural address asserted that the benefits of scientific advance and industrial progress must be made available for, quote, the underdeveloped areas and to, consol and to consolidate U.S. influence in places that might otherwise be infected by communist ideology. This use of influence eventually led to terminology such as developing, third world, still commonly used in literature today, and consequently I'll be using those because they're the ones that we most often recognize in vernacular when we talk about these things. Although the United States has actively under, was actively at that time giving assistance to Latin American governments, in fact well before post-World War II period, this particular action catalyzed a series of events that led to multilateral bodies for government resources to be channeled. And most importantly, it gave rise to the notion that international development was an endeavor that industrialized nations could undertake on behalf of underdeveloped nations. One author noted this, at the heart of volunteering is the belief that in post Second World War II era, backward countries could catch up with the industrialized world through development initiatives. It was under this guise that the movement began for international volunteering as a means of American diplomacy. And in 1960, a young Senator John F. Kennedy launched the United Nations Decade of Developing by announcing, to those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. Shortly after this speech, he challenged students at the University of Michigan to serve their country in the cause of peace by living and working in developing countries. The second view concerning the origins of modern international volunteerism stems from our own heritage of Christian missions. Although primarily concerned with religious proselytizing, early missionaries effectively improved access to education, nutrition, and healthcare. 
In many ways, their service marked the very first united efforts toward development from Western entities, and also led directly to the phenomenon that we know now as short-term missions, which at the time was primarily a strategy to combat the waning numbers of new missionary recruits. Just last month, you may know, Wheaton College celebrated 60 years since Jim Elliott became a martyr in Ecuador with the Quechua Indians. I know that's kind of a, it's an odd thing to celebrate, but they have a celebration. Highly publicized events. And not surprisingly, back in the day when that happened, that highly publicized events and those like it, along with the once compulsory coffin selection, which meant that it would arrive with you on the boat, just in case you didn't make it back, meant that lifetime missionaries started to have a bit of a PR problem <laughs> and needed a 2.0 upgrade. And so they needed to begin to recruit young missionaries and consequently, uh, the brainchild of two organizations that you all may have heard of in the 1950s and 1960s, Operation Mobilization, also known as OM, and YWAM, first mobilized teenagers, YWAM is youth with a mission, first mobilized teenagers in the late 1950s and early 60s and young adults to experience life and ministry in a foreign culture for a short period of time. One author commenting about this wrote, people are expected to arrive automatically at life commitment with nothing more to urge them in that direction than the testimony of missionaries from some foreign remote location. Short-term missions will rectify the situation. They will give the needed opportunity for first-hand evaluation before lifetime commitment. Despite their origins, these two sectors, missions and international volunteers, have now become inextricably linked. Not only in the eye of the media, but by development theorists and academic researchers, because of their outcomes. That although once conceived as long-term engagement models are now attempting to be achieved with much less time and much less skill invested. Although on one spectrum, volunteers and missionaries might focus on distinguished features between them, we like to say that we have different intentions and preparedness, but these things become irrelevant if one turns the table to look at the activity in relationship to community outcomes, which is dependent on the length of engagement and the skill of the participant. Moving short-term missions and short-term volunteerism into a category commonly referred collectively as international volunteering. If it's helpful to know, development volunteering and full-time missions by contrast generally stress long-term partnerships and engage with a local community while international volunteering packages development as a part of a learning experience where the individual community forms a part of the photogenic landscape, which will add value to the authenticity of the individual's learning or adventure. Within the literature, I see people straining for the screen. Um, I put this up because this was part of the blogosphere that demonstrates the families by which people who critique things like poverty tourism, not unlike Jamie, the very worst missionary, how they see categorically how volunteerism fits into frameworks of volunteerism. If you can't see all the way here to the right, on the very bottom, short-term missions is underneath and connected to short-term volunteer trips, which is underneath volunteerism, which provides labor and effectively in the same family together. So it's an interesting family tree, if you will. Within the literature, short term is considered anything less than four months. Consequently, any international volunteering development projects or missions trips run by colleges and universities are therefore considered short term. Even if the ultimate hope for these students is to return for a more permanent post, their contribution to the communities is limited by their overall time and in most cases knowledge of the region. Despite their uncertain outcomes, these sectors have grown exponentially over the past few decades. Based on a national random survey, uh, sociologist Christian Smith reported that 29% of all 13 to 17 year olds in the US have gone on a religious missions team trip. Let me say that again, 29, almost 30% of young adults have gone on a missions trip or religious service project, and 10% of those have gone on three or more. Now, I'm also um, very often surprised, but consistently surprised when I ask first years, how many of you have been out of the country with your church or, or youth group? And probably many of us here um, would, would say that that maybe is us. And so that's, that statistic is not all that surprising. 10 years ago, missiologist Bob Priest collected data indicating that far more than 2 million young adults go on such trips each year. And that was 10 years ago. Since then, indicators have only shown growth. Meanwhile, volunteerism is the fastest growing trend in travel today with more than 1.6 million volunteers spending $2.8 billion each year, according to a recent Reuters report. 
In fact, the phenomenon of volunteering has become so mainstream that the UN General Assembly declared 2001 as the International Year of the Volunteer. And if that's not enough to convince you, then perhaps you can be convinced by two truly cultural icons, Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> who kicked off the summer of 2010 with two new flavors, Berry Voluntary and Brownie Chew Gooder. In partnership with volunteermatch.org, and they encourage consumers to, quote, scoop it forward. <laughs> so even as colleges and universities increase global learning and service experiences, they're falling behind. Until 2010, study abroad had, been, had seen a steady increase for 25 years. But its plateau and subsequent decline has been partly blamed on a decrease in liberal arts students, <clears throat> who are choosing opportunities in the global south rather than traditional study abroad locations in Europe, the UK, and Australia, and on students across the discipline seeking to work or gain internship placements abroad. Instead of choosing to take a few weeks off to suntan or sightsee, students are working in orphanages, building schools, teaching English, and many of them for college credit. For most of these volunteering students, there's a baseline assumption that they can make a positive contribution in the world and it's reinforced by savvening market campaigns. The recruitment takes place under the banner of making a difference, and messages such as change their world, change yours, and develop the world, develop yourself, remain very prevalent. The quote that you see on the board is by the largest volunteer service provider in the US, and oftentimes for credit. I know a lot about them because at one point they were recruiting me for a job, to be the academic director to work with college campuses to give credit. And so sometimes we think of these volunteer providers as something that we don't work with, and yet they're very closely within our networks and many of our students. And in fact, um, a quote that I'll share in a little while came from a student that I was working with at my former institution that did a volunteer placement through one of these organizations. And so one of the interesting things is that um, within their tagline and their mission statement, they say this, you'll see that volunteering abroad can be a safe and exciting adventure the trip of a lifetime where you can learn about another culture while learning about yourself. Change in the world begins with you. You're closer than ever to making an incredible difference. Change their world, change yours. And here it is that we begin to see the shift, where the modern rhetoric about international volunteerism turns ugly. Place within non-government organizations, within communities, volunteers seek to learn about international volunteering through participation, and ultimately, these well-meaning, often affluent, volunteers have sincere hopes to contribute to development and prosperity in the communities they visit. However, many are as unaware of the communities that they go to serve as they are of their perhaps own latent savior complex, and as a result, little attention has been given to assessing the impact of these mechanisms on developing communities. Recent attention, however, has been given to research showing that growing up in an orphanage can negatively affect a child's development and put the child at risk of abuse. International volunteering in orphanages, which usually requires no background check or long-term commitment, increases these risks as, as high numbers of volunteers cycle in and out of a child's life. There was a time where this was the fastest growing part of volunteerism, was orphanage volunteerism. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the increased global discourse in HIV AIDS affected children has created the misleading perception that children have no family or kin to care for them and therefore have contributed to an increasing trend of volunteering to care for AIDS orphans. It's estimated that of the more than two million children that live in institutional care, four out of five of those children have parents. These are hard truths to swallow. And yet UNICEF, Save the Children, large um, networks and resources are going into attempting to track exactly who comes through orphanages and where funding goes. Also, UNICEF reports that the demand for such volunteering placements is increasing the number of orphanages in many countries. Orphanages tend to crop up in tourist locations rather than areas of densest need where there are a lot of orphans. That should tell us something about tourism driving the industry within orphanage volunteerism. All vulnerable children are best cared for in a family-based setting in their own communities and looked after by consistent caregivers, not necessarily short-term volunteers. Therefore, organizations, as I mentioned, Save the Children, UNICEF, about 20 others, are joining a global initiative to campaign against international volunteering. I've been contacted. Can you please take our materials and remind your students not to do international volunteerism in orphanages this summer? 
They want to encourage people to support families and communities instead, which certainly may not be as fun as enticing as holding babies, but inherently more effective. Perhaps the question for us sometimes is how do we break in and know where to best in, invest our resources? There's also clear evidence that real harm can be caused by an uncredentialed volunteer providing direct health care. In development literature, vulnerable populations not only include children, they also include those in need of medical and dental care. And consequently, most colleges have, de have developed strict guidelines for an ethic of care that does not allow undergraduates to extend their reach. Wheaton College, just a few weeks ago, voted to adopt a college-wide policy on these issues. In fact, many students don't know that advances in ethic of care have now led to large-scale efforts to have medical schools systematically reject applicants. And I had a student at my former institution that was rejected from medical school because they reveal overreach in their admissions application and they talk about experience they had where they provided care that they were not trained to provide in the Global South. Dental colleges have now enacted the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm to be effective during pre-professional training. That means in your undergraduate years. In other words, the situation of harm has become so serious, so grave, that advanced, well-networked, and systematic efforts are afoot to stop its spread. Undergraduates that were once guided by passing advice don't do anything that you wouldn't have done to you or to your mother, to very strict lines of observation that mimic US standards. Gone are the days when a student can travel carefree to a foreign land to quote, do things there that I could never do in the US. So these unintended consequences stack with other alarming concerns, such as local economies deprived of gainful employment while students build homes and schools or local markets flooded with, with free goods. One of the stories that I remember was of a woman named Sonia who um, was in the capital city of Chigali. And uh, she used to have a fledgling business of purchasing used tennis shoes in the capital city and transporting and selling them in her small village, which was just about a two hour car drive, a two hour Matatu drive away. But it was demolished when an annual short term summer missions team from a Michigan college that shall not be named began visiting with free clothes and shoes to help several of her neighbors start their own business. Within a few years, Sonia moved to the capital city to find work in the urban center. I don't know what happened to the other mic micro ventures that were effectively subsidized by Western Michigan, but in this case, one might wonder if they just swapped out one entrepreneur for another. So these issues have been documented by development specialists and thankfully, widely exposed. How many of you here have read Brian Fickert's When Helping Hurts? A wonderful um, book, Robert Ludlum's Toxic Charity. And the wonderful list goes on and on. I'm so glad to hear these. One of the things that they were able to do is to bring widely accepted theories of asset-based development and holistic transformation um, to a more pedestrian level, if you will, so that we can all absorb them for pastors, for youth ministers, for students. Fortunately, in this age of information, international volunteering, can no longer be unaware. We have resources. And so let's take a moment and talk a little bit about the discourse or unpack this a little bit as to why some of these things are going on and to what, what are some of the harms that people are pointing to. The greatest concern still remains below the surface even as I mention all of these things because it creates a misperception of the host community for ourselves oftentimes and for the host community. The practice of international volunteering is underscored by colonial power relationships. Barring from Henry Gouraud's critique of neoliberalism, these experiences link individual consumption to the wider development experience of the poor in underdeveloped nations and presents the conflation of private interests and brings into question the very nature, if not the existence, of the democratic process because it normalizes the differential in power between the volunteer who consumes the development experience of indigenous communities and those to whom aid is offered and this view is central to the success of volunteering as it applies that voluntourists have knowledge to give. But it also holds the implicit assumption that locals are ignorant. When volunteers view their activity as helping a needy other, local knowledge and practices are automatically understood as inferior. And dependency theory would argue that development and underdevelopment are two sides of the same coin, that wealth requires poverty. Voluntourism is part of a system of neoliberal development that requires inequality so that some may reap the benefits and the effects of the market. Although the discourse of volunteerism 
frames volunteers as active agents of change by drawing on both the notion of need and the powerful emancipatory language of social change, the emphasis on helping others who need development suggests that the volunteer during their very short stay has the power and capacity to provide what the recipient lacks. Likewise, the nature of the word service connotates an inherent power archy. Anything that is served must be received. Anything given has to have someone on the other side of the transaction to be a recipient. And in its worst case, volunteerism promotes and normalizes narratives of developed and underdeveloped, thus creating what one author calls discursive divisions, boundaries, interfaces, and even morally colored identities, whereby participants come to view locals as belonging to an entirely different material, social, and, and epistemological world. Colonial paternalism was once predicated on the notion that there are haves and have-nots, and that this will always be the case, and therefore one's obligation as a privileged subject is to simply help those less privileged. The certainty underpinning this view prevents volunteers from seeing or engaging otherness and inadvertently reinforcing notions of the savior complex. Also, it simultaneously binds them to the reality that poor people can and do resist their own oppression. Let me say that differently, make sure I say that correctly. It simultaneously prevents people, blinds them from seeing that poor people can and do resist their own oppression and poverty, and they exercise agency when and where possible. And so the volunteer discourse is above all seductive in its promise of a feel-good experience that will benefit both the volunteer and the recipient of their altruism. But what does make us care about such a thing? If we know that this thing is potentially harried, why do we still want to do it? Where does the responsibility arise from? I want to take just a moment and talk about our feelings of moral responsibility to do justice to the question at hand. Consider this reflection by a college student after volunteering for an internship for credit in the summer of 2013. I just wanted to do something that was probably as much about me. By the way, this is not her face. I got this off the internet from a, uh, a friend's um, post. I just wanted to do something that was probably as much about me as about serving, to help other people. And I wanted to broaden my horizon and see what else was happening in the world and to see other people other people's struggles in life and to see how they cope with that. And I also, I believe I had enough skill to be able to offer something to other people. Melissa's reflection on why she decided to volunteer internationally indicates the, this complexity of human engagement and motivation. The activity is simultaneously about giving and taking, generosity and consumption. It's about the deeply personal experience of individual growth, and it's about connecting with others through notions of compassionate giving. And yet it's also political, because it's also about working for injustice in the world. Over the past decade, international volunteering has been conceptualized in studies of development practice as occurring within an emerging global civil society. This posits a system, or a systems thinking, in which states are accountable to transnational agreements and treaties, and this conception allow civil society to move away from its attachments to state and instead shift toward global norms. As actors in this global society, volunteers find purpose in being a good citizen to all, and for many of us, we hear that in terms of being a global citizen. At the risk of opening a can of theolo- I'm looking around the room to see what theologians are in the room, for religious studies people, because I'm gonna open a, th- uh, a can of theological worms and I fear I don't have the deep enough pond fish in it, but I think it's important. I will cautiously point, as we think about these things, to Rodney Clapp's work, A Peculiar People, the Church as Culture in a Post-Christian Society, as he describes Constantinian Christianity, which is when one's religious convictions become swallowed in one's citizenship or, or ethnicity. In a more robust depiction of this global citizenry, John Howard Yoder, a beloved Mennonite theologian, known worldwide for his engagement in social ethics, And even the more famous Stanley Hauerwas teach a distinction between church and the world that allows for for visible entities, but the entity of the church cannot be confused with any single nation. When these cornerstones of the Christian identity become confused with a particular political alignment, cause, or citizenship to a nation state, or any other agenda for that matter, Yoder argues that Christians will then become something other than Christian. 
pledging allegiance to the wrong power. I just last weekend was at the border with um, Jamie Gates, professor of global studies at Point Loma, Nazarene, and he noted in a debrief session, quote, if our baptism doesn't trump our citizenship, then we have a real problem. Herein lies the idea of Constantinian Christianity. Or to quote for one of my favorite theologians, John Paul II, as he writes in Solicitudo Reo Socialis, which is Latin for On Social Concerns, he writes, we are all really responsible for all. And he goes on to write in this hallmark document, a Catholic social tradition, that solidarity is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say that we are all responsible for all, the good of all and of each individual. By this idea, we are obligated to our Christian brothers and sisters anywhere in the globe as much as we are obligated to ourselves, our countrymen and women. This leads us and leads volunteers to a moral and faithful responsibility, a good moral and faithful responsibility to the global community and specifically to care for what Isaiah 1 instructs that we seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. Second and perhaps more, more prevalent notion that has been documented in the field of social work reveals that volunteers often seek an altruistic experience of simply doing good for the sake of it. Not for material, material reward, not for recognition, and not for praise. Altruism is the principle or practice of concern for the welfare of others, a traditional virtue in many cultures and the core aspects of many religious traditions, not just Christianity. And in this, in, in this particular worldview, volunteering is viewed as a mere expression of selfless behavior, which should be an encouragement for a generation that has been assigned somewhat less appealing adjectives in the literature. One psychology professor, I'll tell you who she is, so you're welcome to not like her anymore, Jen Twang, and she wrote in her book, Generation Me, Why Today's Young Adults Are More Confident, Assertive, and Entitled, and More Miserable Than Ever Before. It's wonderful then to know that there is an altruistic spirit that has also been named for this generation, that this is a generation that cares more and wants to do more than most generations before. It's certainly more so than my generation that was just concerned with taking down the powers and the authority above us. However, this simple notion of altruism perhaps an, ignores the reality that while volunteering gives, it's also taking, and that altruism has a shadow side. As the experience of the authentic other and of doing development are also acts, as we mentioned, of consumption. In a neoliberal economic environment, the management of individuals' desire to do good, the management of one's individual desires to do good, is the natural corollary of a service delivery that seeks to harness the disorganized goodwill of individuals and then focus it toward the problem of poverty. Such an approach to the problem underpins the practice of social entrepreneurism, using market solutions, which is advanced as a viable option wherever possible for social problems. Following this logic, profiting from doing good fits with commercial models of good business practice. In this way, volunteerism could position itself as an ethical business rather than a truly altruistic endeavor because it could help the poor while it helps itself. I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. If it feels confusing, I totally appreciate Lori in the front row with a furrowed brow. Because I wanna talk about this. What is this when we talk about these different exchanges? My own research reinforces some part of this. Because I look at the economic exchange over simple community or volunteer benefits. As I mentioned to you, I research community perspectives through interviews, observations, and I examine supporting data to determine the interplay of volunteerism and service learning on participatory development and grassroots civil society organizations. I effectively wanted to know when people from the outside come into a rural community who has development projects that are being done by the community and volunteers attempt to get involved with those, what happens to that project? What happens to the community's perception of themselves and of this development project as a result of this particular volunteer's presence. So based on 91 interviews, document analysis, participant observation, the analysis and findings of community benefits reported that according to three rural communities, and there was multiple findings, I'm just gonna choose a couple, volunteerism and service learning for them was not necessarily about building relationships or schools, 
but about building economic opportunity. By the way, I know you can't see that. I just wanted to throw numbers at you so you know I really did research. <laughs> because we all really feel better when we see that. So those, if, you, if you're interested in this, um, I'm more than happy to share some of the numbers with you and to talk through some of the data. Um, in short, I, I spent quite a bit of time listening um, to people, focus groups, and examining things. But here's the interesting thing about what I found. One of the things that I put forward was that the money generated through, through international volunteers coming and staying with homestays, because in a lot of rural villages there aren't hotels, so most volunteers stay at homestays, so the homestay experience was a necessary and indispensable pathway for community development. By the way, this is the good news. If it felt kind of heavy in here, getting kind of hot. The good news is that communities celebrated when international volunteers came in because the revenue from those volunteers flowed into the community, primarily again from the homestay, which meant, which meant it went directly to the mother, and created an economic circle. The money was used to directly benefit the family and the community because women would go and buy shoes and pay school fees. But they also invested into their homes so that they could get more and more volunteers. It was an economic circle. So that money coming in drove development because it gave money to women that had no opportunity for working outside the home, so they were able to have greater agency. It provided a diversified livelihood in a sustainable livelihood approach. One of the things that we know is that rural communities sometimes experience stress because there's only one mode of um, occupation. In all three of the rural communities that I did research on, they all were seasonal agricultural workers, which meant they had worked six months out of the year, and if it was a dry or a wet year, nobody worked. And so the opportunity for homestays, international volunteers, actually diversified their opportunity for income. So. It became a form, if you will, not a job per se, but the ability for the family to demonstrate more, re more resilience, become more diversified. Effectively an adaptive strategy for coping with stress and an economic development engine. While the volunteers' actual project work hours on agricultural farms, building ecotourism, serving in local health clinics or improving schools was often appreciated, it was not central to the development project's capacity and when probed, a majority of community members noted that volunteer efforts would not be missed, but their stream of revenue would. <laughs> Furthermore, a large majority of homestay families expressed interest in expanding their homestay business, and they referred to it as a business. They hoped to host more volunteers, and while volunteer directors did not report needing more volunteers to complete development tasks, bar none, Every homestay mother asked if I knew anybody that would like to go and volunteer in their community and stay at their home. Clearly they wanted more and not less. So my findings shouldn't negate volunteer work, efforts toward development projects. But again, wise and progressive volunteer programs would tend to tell students volunteer and service is less about building relationships in schools and more about building economic opportunity. Consequently, the implications are that we must consider a rhetoric shift away from language of humanitarian development as the purpose of our trip and our endeavors toward language of economic exchange. That might seem counterintuitive for some. If viewed this way, international volunteering as a potential revenue stream, then those holding the power, in this case colleges and universities and coordinating agencies, must begin to discuss reciprocity in real terms, that is money. For many colleges, the idea of discussing reciprocity with communities in terms of money somehow cheapens the whole exchange. And I know for me, growing up in an era where we talked about we are there to build relationships, talking about that we are there to have an exchange of money felt somehow dirty. Just didn't quite feel right, didn't quite sit right. But not talking about money is a luxury of the wealthy. To only talk about money when you want to. However, when you live closer to the margins, discussions of money are prevalent and even necessary. In other words, one does not have the luxury of not having to think about money in many of their daily exchanges when they are truly in need of it. The ability to choose silence is a sign of ongoing power differentiation and privilege, operating in the nexus of the university community engagement. And it is this deafening silence that reinforces the power hierarchy that we were talking about. Wildman and Davis eloquently state, privilege is not visible to its holder, it's merely there a part of the world, a way of life, simply the way that things are. But if we choose to simply name economic revenue as a potential benefit, 
which communities in my case said was the primary, not just one of the benefits, then it could potentially change the power dynamic to a more realistic relationship where communities can even operate as co-educators for students rather than recipients of a given service. Consequently, this raises some complex questions for us regarding the authenticity of community relationships, especially for short-term participants. If we don't invite community partners to the table to determine fees, what does that say about our partnership? Do they know how much we charge for the excursion? Are we willing to share? Who sets the daily homestay rate? Who tells us how much food is? These are difficult questions when we are balancing a budget. Now, if we were to stop here, we would conclude that international volunteerism serves a purpose of harm over good, we'd throw our hands up and walk away, and I would have named this lecture International Volunteerism. Don't bother. <coughs> You're more harm than help. Please take your ball and go home. That's not the talk of our lecture today. Because it's not the whole story. In truth, communities don't need volunteers, but they want volunteers. They love volunteers. At least the communities that I've talked to. In fact, I started my initial research a bit jaded, and here was my title. The Unattended Consequences of International Volunteerism, The Ugly, The Harm, and The Awful. <laughs> Terrible title. <laughs> Terrible title. And I did my pilot work, fortunately, with Ugandan community development homestay coordinators, um, a group of six of them, a focus group. And they stopped me abruptly in my tracks, probably because it was a terrible title. But on top of it, what they told me was, they knew that volunteers brought some of these negative consequences. They read the reports. They had read NGO fail in Africa. They had read white man's burden. They knew about these things. But overall, they wanted young people and volunteers to come to their community. In fact, most of them wanted more. Some recent research conducted on host communities has shown that volunteers serve as an extra set of hands. They help increase capacity. They do jobs that thin human resourced organizations never get to, even if it includes things like filing. Although this is commingled with the amount of time and skill a volunteer has, there are needed skills such as computer or language skills that can be transferred to host communities, and these relationships frequently grow into global advocacy networks, which then work to support global governance. And they provide norms like transparency, inclusive participation that we see in times of voting, and human rights. So we stand here today with a bit of a dilemma then, don't we? Are we willing to believe that having better educated volunteers and better designed programs will affect structural change? Despite volunteerism's inherent nature of reinforcing the paradigm of need and not enabling agency, perhaps we don't have a choice. As I mentioned earlier, volunteering is a juggernaut, and there's little hope that will arrest its growth. In my own humble opinion, it's time for us to get off the sidelines of Team Critical and head into Team Let's Refine It and Fix It. And I know that many of us in this generation have that kind of optimism, so they haven't thrown their hands up and walked away. We know there are ethical models out there, ways to vet international volunteer experiences, and tools for helping to ensure good rather than harm. Around the world, there's a strong community support for, for community-driven cooperative volunteer partnerships. <coughs> One of those is the Fair Trade Learning Rubric, and I actually brought a few that I'm happy to give out or to send to you. But the idea of the Fair Trade Rubric is looking at how communities value service partnerships, asking them what they value, <coughs> trying to move from a Western paradigm of knowledge of what we perceive that communities value, and actually doing focus groups across Global South communities that receive volunteers and saying, what do you really value? How, do we, how can we ensure that we don't harm your community but that we allow benefits? Some of those partnerships include ensuring community voice and self-direction by utilizing an asset-based capacity building lens, which many of you read about as you all were nodding, talking about toxic charity and when helping hurts. These leverage strengths that are already present in the community and top-down development interventions based on outsiders' perspectives of community don't lead to a meaningful impact and so they are oftentimes shunned. Fair trade learning standards encourage us to engage communities beyond the time horizon of specific physical development projects. These projects like water systems, schools, new parks are important, 
But physical projects are neither the only nor the most important outcome. So engaging communities beyond a short project's time horizon is one of the most important things we can do for long-term development in the community. Nurturing trusting relationships. I know this happens a lot on some of the Westmont programs. Between volunteer organizations and the communities they serve, research even indicates that these long-standing trusting relationships lead communities to developing deeper trust in volunteer organizations or colleges, even more so than in some of the more develop the conventional development organizations. They're more likely to be honest and to share and to even ask for grant money from their friends than they are from government entities. This type of partnership is often characterized by the understanding that if you never do for others what they can do for themselves, that you will empower them. I just want to say that differently. I know one of the things that we oftentimes say in, in international development is never do for someone what they can do for themselves. This is one of the key components of this kind of a trusting relationship. Finally, empowering community members to maintain their side of cooperative development partnerships. Often these commitments become sources of great pride for community members because they allow communities to be empowered. Um, I'm going to go ahead and conclude. I have, a, I have a short video that I could show later if we have time, but I think I'm going to go ahead and conclude. I just want to, yeah. It's been said that perspective is everything. A single act of service can be interpreted multiple ways based on your vantage point. For many of us, we help to construct an image of international volunteering as a well-intended act of service and volunteerism. However, the only interpretation that allows us to determine overall good, or even contribution to common good, is left to our own self-reports. For multiple reasons and limitations, we rarely have an opportunity to understand how the community interprets our work, or rather what their perspectives on our service efforts really are. Although we usually envision and market a set of hands and feet as the mode of betterment, the truth, I believe, is a bit greener. Volunteering is even more than a simultaneous activity of giving and taking. It's an exchange of goods, of services rendered and compensated. Surprisingly, this market component is our unsuspecting hero, moving us away, thankfully, from our notions of salvation. It's not our actual service and giving of our time and talents, but rather the very real revenue that finds its way into the communities we visit silently but prevalently that opens the true floodgates of benefit from the global north to the global south communities. When asked what makes a good life or what is the good life, many Costa Ricans responded with a very simple phrase. Many of you might know it, pura vida. It's a common everyday phrase heard regularly on the street between friends as workers depart for the day and is expected when asked, how are you? How is life? Pura vida. The simple phrase reminds Costa Ricans of the intense pride that they have in their country's wealth of natural resources and beauty. It means pure life. It's not surprising then that when asked why volunteers would come to Costa Rica to partake in volunteering, many of these Costa Rican community members responded with stories of their natural beauty, their pure Spanish language, and the water and streams that teem with life in their community. When asked this question of why volunteers come, one particular one participant simply looked at me quizzically and then swept his hands in a very wide motion around his body, effectively signaling the beauty around him. He did not need words to express his obvious belief that Costa Rica offered so much natural beauty that one would be crazy to not want to reside there or to be a visitor in his community and in his paradise. Another member responded with this confidence. The volunteers, the students, they come because our country is beautiful and they want to learn how to work. We teach them how to work. <laughs> the community did not offer a narrative of need, yet the story being told by the students that I interviewed, by the organizations that sent them, was literally, give a year, save the world. Consequently, it is time for us to begin asking ourselves in our programs, international volunteering, more responsibility, more harm than good, are we contributing to communities in significant enough ways to alter the community's quality of life? Or is the community's impact on the student where real transformation occurs? Are we willing to make difficult choices about the nature of our relationship and our resources and begin to elevate communities to the status of co-educators? Are we willing to learn from them? 
Perhaps once we saw through a glass darkly, but now we can no longer claim to see in part. Now that we see in full, is there really any other alternative? Thank you. Our first respondent, Dr. Tom Connect, has his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. He teaches in the Political Science Department at Westmont, and one of his publications is on service learning, <coughs> interpersonal contact and attitudes toward the homeless. <coughs> Dr. Connect. Thank you all. Um, Cynthia, thank you very much for an outstanding lecture. Um, it's my pleasure to be in front of you and to discuss it. Uh, I think she asked me to discuss her uh, paper on international volunteerism because I'm a professor of American politics who rarely leaves the country. So <laughs> thank you so much for um, selecting me for this topic. Uh, Cynthia and I have kind of two different focuses or foci, foci? focuses, two different dependent variables that we look at. Um, <laughs> Cynthia is interested in how volunteering in service learning affect the communities um, that take place in it. Uh, my interest is how service learning affects the people that actually participate in service learning. So you students that are involved in a service learning class, how does it affect you? Um, and from my research, I, I, what I've found is that it affects you quite a bit. Um, usually it affects your opinions, how you view a situation, how you view um, the people that you're working with. But probably more important than that, it affects your view of the importance of the issue, the salience of the issue, how much you're attentive to a particular issue. So the subject that I look at is volunteering with homeless individuals. And what I found is that spending about six hours working with a homeless individual really changes people's views on the causes and consequences of homelessness, but probably more importantly, it increases uh, the importance that place people place on the issue of homelessness. And this has a profound effect. A lot of the issues that we deal with in this country um, are profoundly affected by the level of aggregate level of public attention. So think about human trafficking. Nobody thinks human trafficking is a good thing. But to the extent that the American government and governments in general do anything about human trafficking, it depends on issue salience. How much are we paying attention to these types of issues? How much are we paying attention to issues of um, homelessness? How much are we paying attention to issues of human trafficking? And so, from my research, and I think this is kind of an interesting relation, is um, not so much the, how much does service learning affect the community, but how much does it affect individuals? And to the extent that, um, that public attention matters in the grand scheme of things, and I, I, I think that these service learning opportunities have a chance to really affect policy in a deep and meaningful way, um, because they, they certainly affect people's lives. But um, I. I definitely agree with Cynthia that we need to think well um, and we need to think long and hard about how we do our service learning and whether we're causing more harm than good. So thank you very much. Dr. Chris Heckley has his PhD in philosophy. He's the head of the Gady Institute as well as teaching philosophy at Westmont. And he and his wife, uh, Dr. Uh, Sherry Larson Heckley, have co led three different semester long programs Europe semester, England semester, and or Westmont in Northern Europe. I'm not sure that anybody else has led that many different semester long programs. Um, so yeah. he uh, hosts annual conversations on the liberal arts, and so he's deeply concerned with liberal arts colleges as well as study with Broad, Dr. Hedger. The first thing you'll notice is that uh, Dr. Connect decided to dress just like me. That was an act of generosity on his part. That was so that later you would think that the clever things he said were things that I said. So thank you, Tom, for that. Cynthia, thank you very much for a, a uh, terrific paper and uh, very thought-provoking. 
challenging. Um, I'll just say qu three quick things, if I may. Uh, the first uh, we might call uh, two cheers for the hands and feet mode of betterment. I took that to be uh, a position that you found yourself critiquing, and I think I shared that critique, but I'll just offer a modest possible defense of um, short-term injections of unskilled labor and maybe short-term injections of uninformed, unskilled labor to make it even worse. Um, my two aunts on my mother's side both spent summers, um, I think during college, um, in post-war Germany um, in, as parts of summer work teams. Um, and their task was very simple. It was to basically clean up rubble from destroyed buildings and clear lots of that rubble. Um, I don't know enough about that activity. That I'm sure there's good analysis of it to know if it was more harm than good, but that example did make me wonder whether we might be able to specify conditions under which short-term injections of, of uh, ignorant, unskilled labor might be beneficial. Um, and here's, a, here's just a possibility. Um, first of all, if there are significant infrastructure needs and a labor shortage, and uh, those infrastructure needs can be helped with unskilled labor, then perhaps that free unskilled labor can help rather than harm. We can certainly see how it can harm by displacing local wage labor, but if there isn't that wage labor, maybe it can be helpful. Uh, second, if the, if the need arises from a crisis rather than being a chronic condition, then maybe service can help restore rather than creating long-term dependency relationships. So I wonder if that's a possibility, that maybe it's helpful in times of crisis, even if it's not helpful in response to endemic uh, long-term chronic conditions. Um, and then finally, what, what the post-war Germany case might illustrate is uh, perhaps if there has been recent animosity between the host culture and the volunteering culture, um, then maybe those work projects can help ease that animosity and heal skeptical uh, misperceptions. So I think, I, I just imagine that the post-war German case might be like that. And we might imagine, maybe you can speak to this, uh, a post-war Syria um, which might have a labor shortage and might have lots of destroyed infrastructure and maybe the injection of well-meaning, relatively unintelligent, unskilled labor um, could in fact be helpful in that context. So I just offer that as, as maybe two cheers for the hands and feet mode of, of betterment. Um, now come the parts where I really feel strongly in agreement with uh, Cynthia and maybe just want to extend the thoughts a little bit. Um, Cynthia notes uh, what she calls the most alarming unintended consequence of uh, volunteerism, which is the reinforcing of perceived and real asymmetrical power relationships. Uh, you call this, Cynthia, colonial paternalism, which is a great term. Um, you note, rightly, I think, that this is harmful to the host country. That, I think, is certainly true. I want to suggest that there's also harm to the participant, and this might actually speak in part to your ideas, Tom. Um, and the harm done, perhaps, to the participant is in the form, uh, is, would be in the form of deepened ethnocentrism. Um, just speaking from my own experience, I went on a, a, uh, short-term mission as a high school student to Mexico from my youth group in, in Waco, Texas. Um, and it had all of the features of the problematic uh, mission trips that we might note. Um, I didn't know anything about the conditions that brought about that need, for example. We didn't, we didn't ask anything of that community what their actual need was, at least so far as I know. Um, and I think that experience invisibly strengthened or deepened my ethnocentrism. I can remember when I was a college student uh, meeting for the first time a middle-class Mexican. And I was really surprised that there was such a thing. That's bad. My only experience of an entire society was of its poorest members. And I, I silently extended that perception to the entire society. Um, so there was clearly a sort of implicit uh, hierarchy of societies going on in my mind as a result, I'm afraid, of that well-intentioned experience. 
I might suggest two antidotes to this reinforcing of colonial paternalism, and one would be, and your comments already spoke to this, one would be to include people of the host culture from a variety of social positions in the encounter. So the idea here would be that participants in the volunteer opportunity meet government officials, meet nonprofit leaders, um, uh, meet people who themselves are addressing the need that the service opportunity is going to meet so that it's clear that there is local expertise on the issue, not just foreign expertise. Um, that might help uh, unbuild the you have the need, we have the solution binary. And then the second thing, the second antidote I might suggest is that the cross-cultural encounter include efforts at learning the language. Um, even if those efforts at learning the language make essentially no progress. Um, I think it's still really valuable because what it does is it puts the volunteer in the position of the ignorant one and puts the local population in the position of authority and power and expertise. It is very hard to feel like the smartest person in the room with all the solutions if you can't even get a sentence out. I think it's a valuable experience for a volunteer to be in that position of weakness. And so I would say that an essential element of uh, short-term volunteer uh, projects would be an effort to learn the language. Okay, finally, um, part of Cynthia's critique, I want to say, extends beyond short-term volunteer opportunities and short-term missions to off-campus academic programs. Um, we might be tempted to make a sharp distinction between short-term missions or service projects on the one hand and educational programs on the other, but I think two of the concerns that Cynthia raised about uh, short-term missions and service projects also apply to educational programs, and the one is consumption. I am collecting experiences that I can later wear as badges of honor with my friends and family. I think that very much applies in the off-campus programs context as well. In fact, you don't actually have to wait very long. It only takes about 20 seconds to post that on Instagram. And I am great at doing that, I have to say. I am called Instagrampa by off-campus programs participants. I'm not a grandpa. Um, so I think the consumption threat is very much present in academic programs as well as in uh, service projects. And the second and I think more acute problem that you name is that's also very present in, in off-campus programs is, you didn't name it this way, but uh, let's try this, co-opting others' pain for the sake of my emotional hit. Um, as Sherry and I lead uh, our most recent program, Westmont in Northern Europe, we're addressing conflict and peacemaking, and that means that we actually have to encounter places of conflict, um, and that's going to have a certain amount of emotional weight involved. Um, but it's very easy in those moments t for other people's real trauma to become our voyeuristic drama. Um, and I think that's, there's something morally problematic in that kind of co-opting of other people's real pain uh, for some kind of emotional hit, even if it's a negative feeling, it's like a big one. And it's something I, in a sense, want. So I think it's a really challenging question how we counteract this inclination to go for the hit. How do we address this co-opting of others' trauma for our drama? Um, sometimes program organizers consciously go for this hit to make it seem meaningful to the participant, and I think we need to stop that. And of course, sometimes the participants want the hit so that the experience feels meaningful, and I think we have to try to encourage people away from that. The problem, of course, is all of that results in programs that might seem much more bland. And then we have recruiting problems. <laughs> um, so this is where I think uh, all of us have a role to play. The entire community has a role to play. We have to start talking differently 
about our international experiences um, so that bland is good, basically. Um, students returning from international experiences need to talk with prospective participants in ways that make bland good. And um, <coughs> faculty advising for these experiences need to talk in ways that make bland good. Uh, admissions counselors promoting these experiences to prospective students need to talk in ways that make bland good. Um, I just want to say three cheers for bland. Um, <laughs> and I think all of us need to talk that way. And, and that's why, Cynthia, I am tremendously grateful for your talk tonight as just a major contribution to this conversation. So thank you very much. I'm going to try to hit some of both of those points. How long? A few minutes? You'll, you'll flag me? Oh, okay. Um, first of all, thank you for those, thanks for thoughtful comments. I want to hit on a couple of things that you both said. First, um, Dr. Connect, you know, service learning is something that is highly researched in institutions, which is no surprise that you've spent time thinking about this. Um, as higher education institutes, we're not in the business of community development. We're in the business of student development. And so we tend to look at the impact of these experiences on students. And so to be honest, your research is quite useful. Mine will get this airtime, but then yours is actually applicable to those of us doing this work. That being said, every chance I get, I say to someone, we know a lot, we know volumes. There is a book that has over 200 different inventories and surveys on how to measure a service experience with college students. That's how much we know. We know so much we have to create a volume just to log all of it. Here is where, here, so here is where I would say we want to do and spend more time thinking about impacts because that is, if, if our real rhetoric is that we want to make changes in the world, we need to figure out what those changes are. If that's not our rhetoric and we want to have changes in students, then we're doing the right thing there. Now I also want to say um, a lot of international service learning research comes directly from domestic service learning. It's been going on since the 70s. Some of the best thinkers are there. One of my favorite books by Randy Stoker, Unheard Voices, talks about communities' responses to service learning. And to be honest, a lot of those things are not so different from the rhetoric that I talked about tonight. But here is where domestic service learning, I do think this is an important point that I want to make sure that I make. Domestic service learning, when we talk about kind of the, the, the global, global forces at work right here in our communities. The reason why domestic service learning, which is also transformative, which is also equally as adventurous because you're crossing lines of ethnicity, of economics, of people's life journeys that have looked very different than yours. But the reality is that it is, it's the devil that you know because you know the language, because you understand race dynamics in America, or at least you're trying to that when you finish that experience, the application of policy and culture is something you're gonna use the rest of your life, most likely. Less than 1% of students that travel abroad end up going back to that community for the long term. So that means if you really wanna do something that's gonna help you for the rest of your life, act and think differently as you walk through your day to day, domestic service learning is where we should be. And, and really progressive programs, um, require that students spend, so for example, the global studies term at Azusa Pacific requires that students spend a full semester in the LA term, in downtown LA. You have to be there a whole semester and do a homestay with a family of a different ethnic background than yours before they'll send you overseas to get your global learning term degree. So there are people who have thought deeply and well about this. I'm getting tangential without, without a lot of time. I want to make sure I hit a couple of the others. Um, the other thing that you had mentioned that I love that you brought, uh, brought up, um, Chris, I'm going to jump to yours, this idea of labor shortage. If, if it wasn't so hot, I'd turn back on my thing and, and show the delineation between, I, I have something at, on, that is um, a pathway of decision making between when things can be helpful or not. And here's the, here's the thing with labor shortage. You're right. Some of the things we're talking about now tend to not be in areas where there's labor shortage, but rather resource shortage and a prevalence of people that are labor, that labor that's there. So, um, but that still doesn't necessarily address the, the issue of agency. So if someone were to go in to, in to volunteer their time in the situation that you were talking about, it still doesn't enact 
agency within communities and work against hegemonic paradigms, which when you do for other people when they can do for themselves, that's the biggest concern. So I also just briefly want to say the, the fear about deepening ethnocentrism, bland is good. Absolutely agree with that. The, the programs I tend to recommend to students are programs that are about learning. So you are going to observe. I, I mentioned to some students Child Family Health International. They have educational tours where you literally go and you simply watch people in their culture addressing issues in their community. And you learn from different levels of those people. And the ultimate hope is that you're able to go back someday and to do development volunteering or work in a sector that then affects development in that community rather than the short-term opportunity. Um, one more thing I want to say. Um, I love that when you mentioned, um, is there a place for service projects in rebuilding a place like Syria? One of the most interesting things I came across in my own research that I almost looked at for a dissertation, in post-genocide Rwanda, there was a compulsory community service enacted across the entire country. So on three hours, um, on a Sunday afternoon, everyone was required to do community service. And so the entire country was out doing community service. People were assigned different things. Why is that? Yes, there was work to be done, but more importantly, it's because it increased the social contracts, the social fabric within that country because it got people out serving together all at the same time. And so service projects can be an incredible mechanism for rebuilding countries. And international volunteers, they were, people were called on in countries like ours to talk about what are the best methods and models for our community to do community service because you all have been doing it for decades. And so we have that to offer. Okay. I'm going to, I think, stop there. Thank you all for listening. I really appreciate your time. And I'll turn it back over to Paul Delaney. Hello, no? and